with John 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 John. Hello and welcome to episode 23 of Celluloid Junkies. I am Luke Kane and sitting beside me in their hard hats are Damien Heath. Hello. And Cassandra Kane. Hello. How are you, Cass? I'm well. We're very excited this month. We are profiling James Bridges' 1979 thriller, The China Syndrome. The China Syndrome. It's about people. People who lie. And people faced with the agony of telling the truth. Right. People like Kimberly Wells a television reporter paid to smile, not to think. A few words about a veterinarian who makes house calls on sick fish. Or is it aquarium calls? Richard Adams, a cameraman who never learned how to play by the rules. Wait till you get that other room, get that radiation all over that cute little body. Jack Goodell, an engineer who knows too much to tell the truth. In anything that man ever does, there's some element of risk, right? Well, that's why we have what we call defense in depth. And cares too much to lie. No accident. It will start with a tremor in a nuclear power plant. Where it will end will depend on three people. I would say you're probably lucky to be alive. Same for the rest of Southern California. Jane Fonda. Let's face it, you didn't get this job because of your investigative abilities. Kimberly, don't fight it. Jack Lemmon. There was a vibration. Michael Douglas. I don't know that accident is the right word. Accident is the right word. The China Syndrome. The harder they try, the more resistance they meet. They've got their own security man. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you want to make it any clearer? The closer they get, the more threatening it becomes. The China Syndrome. Today, only a handful of people know what it really means. And they're scared. Everybody keep your station! Everybody keep your station! Soon. You will know. The China Syndrome. The long evolution of the China Syndrome began in 1972 when it was conceived by Mike Gray, a Chicago-based documentarian and activist who'd made a handful of award-winning films. Originally planned as a documentary, Gray rewrote the script as a fictitious thriller about an accident at a nuclear power plant. In April 1976, it caught the eye of Michael Douglas, a TV actor turned producer who'd recently scored big with his award-winning film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. When Douglas shopped the property around, he was turned down by 12 investors, including two major studios. Richard Dreyfuss, who was attached to Star, was refused a higher salary and dropped out. Meanwhile, Jane Fonda and her producing partner Brian Gilbert had set up their own production company, IPC Films, and were going into production on their first film, Coming Home. For the next venture, they tried but failed to secure the rights to the Karen Silkwood story. Fonda turned her attention instead to a project about a female television reporter grappling with workplace sexism and the changing face of broadcast journalism. The vice president of production at Columbia, Ros Heller, suggested Douglas contact Fonda about Gray's script. Douglas handed her a copy of it on the set of Coming Home, even though at that stage it had no part for her. In it, she saw a chance to merge an anti-nuclear power agenda with a critique on broadcast news. With Fonda attached, Gray was out as director. Brian Gilbert eventually convinced filmmaker James Bridges to direct. He now had the unenviable task of fusing together two distinct divisions of the film into one cohesive story. They brokered a negative pickup deal with Columbia Pictures, which meant that they were able to shoot the film without studio interference, but with a guaranteed distributor. Jack Lemmon, a vocal opponent of the nuclear industry, was cast as conflicted protagonist Jack Godell. Production began on roughly a $6 million budget, Three technical consultants were hired to ensure the film was as accurate as possible. Sensing danger, the Department of Energy refused its cooperation and various power plants refused access to their sites. A power plant set was built on the Columbia backlot. The Trojan nuclear power plant in Oregon allowed the production in to shoot, but a few of the workers were hostile to the actors and crew whilst filming. Near the end of principal photography, Jane Fonda stumbled and fractured her ankle. She finished her scenes in a small cast. Released on March 16, 1979, The China Syndrome was an immediate hit at the US box office. Reviews were favourable despite vocal nuclear energy advocates who accused the filmmakers of sensationalism. 
Their voices were silenced, however, when on March 28th, just 12 days after its release, an accident at the Three Mile Island Nuclear Generating Station in Pennsylvania uncannily mimicked the events as they are depicted in the film. With no accompanying footage, news outlets actually used images from the China Syndrome to report the story, in what became another bizarre instance of the film's DNA seeping into real life. Confused and frightened, people flocked to the cinema in order to understand what had happened in their own backyard. The combined effect of the accident and the film's release popularised the anti-nuclear movement, was the catalyst for new regulations and derailed the industry's plans for expansion in the US for almost 30 years. The film itself grossed over $50 million and was nominated for four Academy Awards, but these accolades pale next to the film's political impact. To this day, it remains an uncanny illustration of cinema's potential, that it has the power to inspire cultural movements and alter the course of history. So, Damien, tell me about you and the China Syndrome. I think I first saw China Syndrome soon after meeting you. When I first met you, you were given a whole bunch of Jane Fonda films on DVD, and the China Syndrome was one of them. And so you introduced me to the film. It uh, belongs to, look, a genre that I could just watch films from all day long, every day. So it's really very exciting. I love the movie. Cass? I can't remember when I first saw it, but I'm guessing it was when your love of Jane Fonda began and you did get a bunch of movies and we just added it to our list of things to watch. But watching the film is just so easy to watch. It's so entertaining. It's so much fun. Well made, well acted. So, yeah, it's just such, it goes by in two minutes. I first saw the movie about 15 years ago when I was working my way through the Jane Fonda canon. I'd seen Clute, and I thought she was an amazing artist. And so then I was just pouring through all of her films, and I think I loved it before I understood it. And even now, having done a bunch of research for this episode, I'm still not sure I totally understand it. It's a very complicated procedural. It's very much a procedural. And I've always loved people at work movies. They're not made often, but in this case, it's people at work trying to do their job and finding that what they are being asked to do conflicts with their own personal ethics. There are people like Richard, Michael Douglas's character, who don't see a conflict between what they do and what they believe in. But then there are people like Jack and Kimberly who are balancing what they believe with other considerations like job security and career ambition and loyalty to the company that employs them. The political ramifications of the story work because they are really nicely cushioned with real human touches and there is so much humanity in this film and I think that that's really important. You know, it could have been very cold and forensic but it isn't. And that's in large part thanks to what Jack Lemmon and Jane Fonda bring to the film and bring to their characters. But, you know, more broadly, this film is about what happens when technology advances beyond our ability as human beings to take responsibility for it. It's like a contemporary Frankenstein tale. You know, it's the idea of we build the very monster that spells out our undoing. And it deals with the threat of self-annihilation. In many ways, the viewer is the victim of this film. Steve McQueen and Paul Newman race against time as one tiny spark becomes a night of blazing suspense. The Towering Inferno. There are some differences between China Syndrome and most disaster films. In the 70s, this genre, I mean, it had dated back to the silent era, but in the 70s, it was just really finding its feet again. Thanks a lot to people like Irwin Allen, who had produced The Poseidon Adventure in 1972 and The Towering Inferno in 1974. The genre during this decade, it moved decidedly away from sci-fi, where it had been in the 50s and toward either natural or man-made threats. You know, like the large building burning down or the luxury cruise ship overturning in those two movies. Uh, A blizzard and a bomb-wielding madman in airport. A viral epidemic in the Andromeda strain. An earthquake in Earthquake. An avalanche in Avalanche. And a meteor in Meteor. Uh, A retelling of the 1937 airship disaster in the Hindenburg. An oil refinery explosion in City on Fire. The threat of individual terrorism in films like Two Minute Warning, which was a sniper at a football game, and Roller Coaster, which was a bomber who targets rides at amusement parks. Computers developing human-like intelligence and deploying this against humanity in Colossus, The Forbin Project, which was also written by James Bridges, and in Demon Seed. And, of course, nuclear energy in The China Syndrome, A Boy and His Dog, Grey Lady Down, and Chain Reaction. The reason I say The China Syndrome is really interesting in this uh, pantheon of disaster films is that most of those films involved an absolute calamity 
followed by a quest for survival among the participants. And the the China Syndrome was more of a warning. The reactor doesn't blow, doesn't release radioactive materials that would cause the title to occur. In this sense, it also ties in really well with other anti-government or paranoid thrillers from the same decade. So we're talking All the President's Men, The Parallax View, Capricorn One, The Conversation. Following in the wake of both the Pentagon Papers and Watergate, and the subsequent impeachment and resignation of uh, President Nixon, government distrust was at an all-time high. And the China Syndrome took the threat of nuclear safety, distrust of the government, and the success of the disaster genre and melded them into one of the most timely pieces of fiction ever created. And the film is very much about peeling back the curtain. I think it's very telling that the film begins with what is essentially a shot of a... like we're watching television. But then the camera slowly pans back and then we see the engineers and everybody who are controlling everything. And so immediately the film tells us that we're not going to just be looking at what we're told, but why we're told it and what the unseen drivers are that are altering how this information is actually coming to us. And, you know, that speaks to this idea of, you know, it is sort of like a a paranoid thriller in many ways, the China Syndrome. And I think what is interesting about all of that is it's not retrospective, like it is of its time. So it is giving you an insight into thinking at that time. Like so often you, a lot of what you see ends up being sort of a look back, so it has the benefit of hindsight, but this, I think, is just in its time. It's actually two weeks before its time. It, it, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's why I say it's timely. I mean, you couldn't get a more timely movie, could you? <laughs> it is uncanny. And, and previous to the release of the film or upon the release of the film, and it's just stunning that this stuff occurred and is out there. I mean, if you have a subscription to the New York Times, you can go back and you can read from the week of release of the movie. They took six six nuclear experts to a screening of the film on March 18th. So this was two days after it opened and ten days before Three Mile Island. One Westinghouse executive, which was a company that made reactors that were used in 37 nuclear power plants in the United States at the time, said it was full of, quote, technical flaws and it develops an overall character assassination of an entire industry. Dr Norman Rasmussen, professor of nuclear technology and long-term advocate of atomic energy, stated that the possibility of a nuclear meltdown was once in a million years and about as likely as a meteor wiping out a major city and i think we're still waiting on the meteor but we've seen at least two nuclear meltdowns since the movie came out daniel ford who was the director of the union of concerned scientists stated that the failure of the pump support as occurred in the film could lead to a loss of coolant accident that could set the stage for a meltdown which is pretty much exactly what would happen at three mile island less than two weeks later so i mean that was right on and my favorite was david ross an engineer at commonwealth edison company which owned and operated seven nuclear plants which provided 8.5 million people with power in illinois defiantly stated that quote i don't believe a serious accident could ever happen and uh, last i heard he was um, still cleaning the egg off his face we are naming and shaming this episode (laughs) let's just talk a little bit about hollywood and nuclear energy and nuclear war. I think Hollywood has had a little bit of trouble looking directly at the Manhattan Project and the bomb. There are notable exceptions like Dr. Strangelove and The Day After, which explore the implications of nuclear war, but The China Syndrome was the first mainstream film to look at nuclear energy. The 1950s science fiction, we got, you know, all of these films which were definite responses to the Cold War, to communism paranoia, and all of those things were frightening to us because we were frightened of nuclear war, but they didn't actually go as far as to look at nuclear war. However, I think that the trope of the mad scientist in these films is a direct response to the bomb. You know, this character is usually so enamoured with the scientific possibilities of this threat, whether it be a monster or an alien or a weapon, that he ends up working against the humans in order to protect it. And I think the mad scientist embodies what must have been a widespread belief at the time that the men who created the bomb were mad geniuses who couldn't be trusted. I think it's also another another example of distrust where there is something that could potentially be harmful to humanity which is being kept under wraps. And I think that was just an ongoing theme at the time, even as far back as the 50s and a lot of this original cinematic response to nuclear energy was in the 50s and particularly from Japan, uh, they made Godzilla which is uh, about a dormant monster, prehistoric monster, who is uh, awakened after nuclear tests in the ocean, basically. And uh, the second most popular one, Mothra, 
was uh, also from a voyage to an irradiated island. So, I mean, that was that was really the sci-fi kind of response to nuclear energy. And as you said, there's a few different ones in the US. Dr. Strangelove, obviously, that's one of them. And it deals with pretty serious ideas in a comic sense. Um, another one is Failsafe. Uh, and in the UK in the 60s, there was uh, there were a couple of them. There was a comedy called The Bed-Sitting Room and a documentary-style film called The War Game. There are two reasons why Hollywood hasn't looked seriously at the bomb. And I think, first of all, you've got to remember that the US was the first country to manufacture the bomb. So this would have been hailed as a momentous achievement that ended the Second World War. Hollywood in the 50s was probably more than a little reluctant to tamper with that narrative, that this is a real US victory achievement. And I think it could have even been viewed as unpatriotic to see it any other way. Even though the bombs obliterated two cities and killed, you know, 100,000 people and left many survivors to waste away from cancer, it indisputably made the US the most powerful and formidable nation in the world. Secondly, I think it's just too dark. How do you tell a story about a bomb that goes off and kills many people in an instant and then leaves many left behind? You know, how do you make that cinematic? How do you turn that into a narrative? I think it's probably just a very difficult subject matter to look at directly. And I think that's why we get more these sort of um, analogy type stories or metaphor type stories that look at the bomb and the Cold War and things like that. I mean, look, I guess you would have to go the Schindler's List kind of route and find find an uplifting story in amongst Hiroshima. Yeah. Mm. We had a problem at the plant a couple of days ago. Oh, yeah, I heard, but I heard everything checked out fine. You're going back on the line today? We're back on the line. Uh, did you sign for these x-rays? Yeah, that's my signature. What about it? signed the same one over and over. All the wells are fine. How do you know if you didn't check them? Every well I checked was fine. How many didn't you check? I said all the wells were fine. How can you say all the wells were fine? The plant may not be safe. The plant is perfectly safe. Listen to me, Royce. We may have a serious problem, and I don't have time to go through every one of those goddamned x-rays. I get a straight answer out of you or else. Now, how many and which ones? I don't remember. There's plenty more where those came from. Oh, don't be childish. You know the procedures. Look, there's no problem. Don't make a problem. Those wells have held for six years. They'll hold for 6,000 more. I'm going to the NRC. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Get off. Think it over. You don't know what you're talking about. You're talking about a billion-dollar lawsuit. It would send them in a receivership. Will you wait a minute? Slow down, goddammit. Obviously, a big part of this film is about the kind of outsiders versus the greedy bureaucrats. And we have Kimberly Wells and Richard Adams, and they're both treated like outsiders. And Jack Godell, once he starts to express his concerns, is sort of eschewed as an outsider as well. Do you think the China Syndrome is a little too didactic in its storytelling? Well, it verges on it, I think. Um, it definitely has good guys and bad guys kind of thing, and they're relatively one-dimensional, so I think, yeah, mm. short answer. Yeah, I think the characterizations in the China Syndrome are really one-dimensional to begin with. Many of them stay this way. The plant PR guy, the plant foreman, Richard Adams even. Adams is described in Bridges' script as an intense young man with a beard who spent his formative years in the 60s and always has a cause. And that was a pretty conservative view of the anti-nuclear protesters at the time. Most of the news crew or the, the producers in the news team are one-dimensional too, although they do have, I guess, their moment of levity at the end when they congratulate Kimberly on her job at the after the um, climax. But the real character arcs, obviously, they belong to Jane Fonda and Jack Lemmon. And I think it's difficult to fault Wilford Brimley in his role as Ted Spindler. You know, this is the second film we've done with him after we did our first episode on The Thing. I find it really troublesome with his character that there is a point during the film where he he succumbs to finally being given credence by his employers, which happens really quickly. In one moment, he's saying to Jack Goodell, you know, who do you think they're going to blame? I'm just a company guy. Uh, and the next moment, he is essentially Jack Goodell. He's, he's the replacement of Jack Goodell. And that elevation happens far too quickly. But his scene at the end kind of redeems redeems him and his character. He does become a bit of a nasty for a little while. I think he's more just passive, though, isn't he? I would, would, would you say he's malicious? I think, I think he's just kind of... No, I think he's just a, afraid of losing his job. Yeah, I think he's just trying to survive. Yeah, I, I think he's the kind of... A lot of people don't have causes. They're just trying to get through. Life is hard enough, and I think he's that kind of guy. Mm. But at the same time, he's the one who 
he's the one who really notices at the start hey there's something wrong here on the gauges or the trembles or whatever but then he's so willing to toe the company line which you don't get that impression when you first see him in the movie i get the impression that he's very likable he's probably a, a, a quite generous person and, and considerate of others the film essentially creates these two groups which are very separate and that's the corporate executives versus the people working on the ground. You know, the divide becomes literal with the glass galleries, and it's in both hierarchical structures, the newsroom and the control room at the plant, they both have glass galleries that look out onto where the, you know, the worker bees are. And the corporation even has the boardroom. They have that set one scene where it's yes. elevated to the next level and there's massive overlooking the city. And... Mm. Which can be equated to the scene where Jane Fonda and uh, Michael Douglas are brought in to discuss the tape and whether or not they're going to play it. So it's like, you know, the little moment where the plebs are brought into the corporate bureaucratic world for a moment to be questioned and to be challenged, really. Well, I mean, the viewing room in the nuclear plant is essentially the same as the producer's office in the television station. Yeah, Yeah, exactly the same. And I I think the film is aware of that. Mm. And it's really interesting as well. When Richard steals the tape, the news boss tells Kimberly that she has to get the tape back, otherwise she'll lose her job. And at the same time, Jack Godell and... What's his name? Ted Spindler. They're facing an investigation that may cost them their jobs. So, you know, there's all of this blame assignation going on. Like, the top cat guys are like, well, it couldn't be our fault. It's one of their fault that this has happened. You know, there's that wonderful line in the movie where Jack Godell says to um, Spindler, why do you think they, they would need a scapegoat? And he says, tradition. This is how it goes. If there is a mistake, somebody pays the price, and it's usually a middleman guy. Yeah, and why wouldn't, yeah, the leader of the corporation take accountability for their hiring choices or their training choices? Or <laughs> so actually, no, it's got to be somebody else's fault. When really, it is not Kimberly's fault, it is not Richard's fault, it is not Jack's fault, and it's not Ted's fault. It is... You know, it is the fault of the higher-ups. They have the power, and they have the power to say, it's not my fault, it's somebody else's. When they were um, promoting this film, they were very, very um, anxious not to make it a political issue, so they were saying this is about corporate greed and about bureaucracy and all of that. And I think we see that certainly in that sort of first act of the film where we see all of these jobs being threatened for all these various reasons. I mean, do you think the character arcs that are undertaken by Jane Fonda and Jack Lemon are particularly groundbreaking? I don't know if they're groundbreaking. I think they're fascinating and compelling, but do they break new ground? I suppose we've seen it all throughout history, or, or certainly in film, throughout film history. I don't know, they're noticeable, like, and I think they're done in a way that's probably more realistic than sensational, which I'd like. Yeah. Like, particularly, um, you know, when they're at the bar together. They're kind of backing themselves, and then they both find themselves at this bar, and then they become really... I don't know, he's defending the the company and saying PR is really bad and then he's flirting with her and she's saying I'm not an investigative journalist and I do all these puff pieces. It's like they're both in this like really low point about themselves and they're quite self-doubting and confused and then both the scenes that follow that, I think it's him actually going out and finding the leak. So he kind of then takes some accountability and wants to go find out more. And for her... She goes out and finds a real story. He ditches the whale thing and goes to the hearing, I think, or something. Yeah. That does something kind of... It's sort of that. I like how they sort of come together at that bar moment. They're kind of disintegrating because they're both getting quite down on themselves and their decisions and whatever, and then they have this kind of awkward moment where they're not really talking to each other, but they're talking to each other, and then they kind of lift out of that. So I quite liked how that told that story so that those were interesting without being, you know, a complete 180 of who they are. They kind of become mirrors of one another. In a way, yeah. In The China Syndrome, Jane Fonda plays Kim Wells, a TV reporter who does the light stuff, you know, the happy news, and all of a sudden she and her cameraman, Michael Douglas, discover a very important news story, a possible accident at a nuclear power plant which is managed by Jack Lemon. The accident could mean a mushroom cloud over the southwest or an expose of how the big honchos of the local power company have little regard for human life. So the reporter leaps into action to bring the true story to the TV screen. I gave up long ago the the belief that movies were to be used as propaganda. First and foremost a movie has to be entertaining. It has to take you on emotional trip. It has to take your heart and your mind and bring you out of yourself somewhere else. If on top of that It'll also make you think, then that's greatness. 
So Jane Fonda said that um, when she started her production company that she wanted to make films that Hollywood should be making but wasn't making. And she said that the characters would exist in a film that would start with an ordinary individual solidly wedded to society's traditional values and beliefs. He or she, as a result of a logical flow of events, undergoes a deep emotional experience and becomes awakened to a reality he or she never realised existed before. And that character gains the audience's sympathy. So the idea is that the audience may think the same as this character at the start of the movie they would see this character reacting to this series of logical events and they would come to the same understanding of the events and I think that's a perfect explanation of what Jack Goodell in particular goes through in this movie Kimberly Adams for me is essentially the vehicle through which this arc and this story this narrative about nuclear power is made public it's interesting that she is this vessel in the movie her character is a vessel to make stories public as well Jane Fonda you've got to remember had been playing this character for a while the same character so from 1977 to 1980 her character was always the same in Coming Home Fun with Dick and Jane The China Syndrome Julia and 9 to 5 she starts out as apolitical very naive and then through adversity and experience becomes politicised and consequently is made whole And the subtext here is that until her political awakening, she is vulnerable, deficient, sort of unhappy, uh, often without even knowing it. But also, I guess that's her idea of trying to empower an audience is that, hey, I'm going to look at these people as though they are not political at all, like my character, and I'm going to make them political through my character. I mean, that's the power that a, a performer has. The films, Julia Coming Home, 9 to 5 and and China Syndrome, are all very intelligently made, intelligently scripted and powerfully acted films, and we do buy into it. There might be a slight problem with it in terms of it being a little oversimplified. You know, obviously, you know, becoming politically aware is not the answer to everyone's problems. So the fact that these characters are totally transformed by the fact that they become politicised is a little oversimplified, I would say. If you accept the story on its own terms and for what it is trying to do, it is perfectly serviceable and fine, and we do buy into it. And look, by the end of the film, when Jane Fonda is trying to hold it together with that microphone at the end, I am emotionally invested in her, and I love what she does. But obviously, in retrospect, I look back at it and think, okay, well, there is more to life than just becoming politically conscious. Please, please, let me ask a question. Sorry, just come around. Now, now, just a minute, Miss Wells. The man was emotionally disturbed, and I'm telling you... Who ordered the SWAT the, squad into the control room? I told room. you, I told you, he was out of control, he was dangerous, and the, they had no choice in the matter. Do you agree with that? Was Jack O'Dell emotionally disturbed? Was he a disturbed man? Did he have reason tonight to be disturbed? I don't know. Mr. Gibson said he was drinking. Is it true? I don't know. Don't know? How do you account for his behavior tonight? What did he say to you, Mr. Spindler? I read a really frustrating uh, review from some blockheaded feminist who said that Jane Fonda being unable to compose herself at the end shows that she is not actually able to do hard news. I mean, that was a pretty common reading of the film, I found. So I would argue that anyone who had been through what she had been through, which is a siege and watching a man get shot to death in front of her. It wasn't just that she was reporting the news. She, in this instance, was part of the news. Any man who was reporting that story and didn't feel like he had to cry or break down is not equipped to handle hard news and should probably see a psychiatrist. At the end of the day, she does get through that report. I mean, she struggles to keep it together, but she does finish giving her broadcast. And at the end of it, she cries, which is a healthy expression uh, and reaction to what she had just been through and anyone who did not react that way is sick or unwell or, or doesn't have proper access to their emotions and probably shouldn't be doing a job that intense it's such a stupid criticism and to come from a woman it is particularly vexing to me that you know she would say you know it goes to that whole thing about our oh, real real men don't cry to be a real feminist you need to we need to be more like men you know all of those ugly block-headed ideas of feminism are totally illustrated in that criticism. You can make an argument for anything if you want to. I mean, you can make the argument that Jack Goodell is really terrible with his words when he gets the opportunity to to tell on live TV what the problem is because he really... Bungles it. Yeah, but that's not brought up, (laughs) you know, as some kind of... Criticism on masculinity. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for finding the words for me there. 
It's all right. So when she was emotional about it, I had the initial thought of people are going to criticise this because she's a woman and now she's crying and that's not what, you know, good investigative reporters do. But I completely thought it worked and felt like it made her human and completely understandable given everything that had happened up until that point. But it is interesting that I just had the sort of, oh, now this is going to be, you know, criticised. And and I was just saying to Damien before that I, I found it interesting that scenes before her arc, before she kind of made her shift, when she was in that room and they were discussing, you know, the fact that they had recorded the video of the accident and, you know, they were arguing with their boss around whether or not they could use the footage, how Richard was the hysterical, emotional, typically what women would be criticised for and she played the very kind of passive, like, mediating, rational, unemotional role and it's like, well, would that feminist say that was a better role for her? Do you know what I mean? (laughs) To to be playing that role? Like, I wouldn't think so. No, they would have said that she was shrill and that Richard was, you know, the lucid one. Richard being like that, it's like, oh, he's just a man who believes in what he believes in. Yeah. Whereas if a woman had been doing it, she would have been shrill and yappy and emotional. Yeah, wouldn't have worked for her at all. Tony Shaw is interviewed on the Indicator release of the China Syndrome Blu-ray and he says that the film pinpoints an energy media complex which existed in the US in the 70s. There was and remains a common belief that collusion exists between the mass media and big business, including the nuclear industry, whereby information is being withheld from the public for corporate gain. The portrayals of the plant owners and the operators, that obviously probably the most one-sided in this film, and it's pretty easy to see why the nuclear industry considered this character sabotage on a personal level. Going back to that New York Times screening, Westinghouse executive John Taylor stated that what hurt him most about the film was that the utility chairman and the plant foreman were portrayed as morally corrupt and insensitive to their responsibilities to society, which is inaccurate and incredible. But on the other hand, Anthony Roisman, who also attended that screening, he was the attorney for the Natural Resources Defence Council said that reactor safety is inherently involved in a conflict between what is required and corporate profits. There is no cheap safety. It always costs money and there always have to be compromises and standoffs. The film kind of simplified it like it did with most things. There's a grey area of juggling cost, profit and safety. Uh, The film makes it black and white and I think this is just an ongoing shortcoming of Hollywood cinema. If Dr Strangelove told us that we can't handle nuclear energy because we are fools then China Syndrome tells us that we can't handle nuclear energy because we are greedy. And both are true. We didn't invent the nuclear controversy. Mm -hmm. It's there. We just chose it as a backdrop because it's uh, mysterious, awesome, new. It's never been done before. I mean, the film should not work. It really should just be a hot mess because the nuclear story is complex enough But then the film adds to that this whole other story about workplace sexism and broadcast news and how newsrooms work and how they are in collusion with the nuclear power plants to present a fiction about what is really happening. But the fact that it works so well, that it fuses the two ideas so well, I mean, it works in part because they are symbiotic. But it works also because of how well the film handles, particularly exposition. This film handles exposition so expertly. Because obviously we go into the film knowing nothing about how nuclear power plants work. But then there's that very early scene where Jane Fonda is talking to the PR guy and he just uses that simple diagram to give her and us an overview of how the reactor works and how it interacts with the cooling tower and everything like that. But then it does it sort of again and again. I mean, one of the most brilliant moments of exposition is when Jane Fonda is running through the safety hearing. She's just running through, but we get to see little sound bites and little pieces of information about how people are actually protesting nuclear power. That's just so clever because it's not even it's, it's on the film's periphery. Really we're focusing on Jane Fonda getting the there in time to meet Richard to get back the tape. But whilst that is happening, we're getting all this other information about what's going on. There was a lot of criticism from uh, leftist film reviewers about how the film kind of simplified the nuclear problem. It kind of made it seem like a meltdown was the only kind of problem that we were facing. It didn't deal with things like the long-term disposal of radioactive waste. And a lot of people said that it made anti-nuclear protesters look stupid. I disagree with that because there's that scene with that woman being interviewed and she talks about her children's safety and her children's children's safety. And they were saying that that's a a common thing for people to focus on in anti-nuclear protests, which is 
isn't really dealing with the problem and how do we fix it it's just dealing on a personal level with the effects of you know this could go wrong and this could influence my children or this person's children or your children but it doesn't provide an answer to the problem yeah but it's a complex issue and they're not going to be able to get everything across in a 90 minute or two hour thriller but then that maybe also feeds into this whole idea of media and how that tells its story to the public and then what the public actually know and then what they're able to considerably talk about that protester that you just brought up, she is made even more sympathetic because we see her as she is being watched by the plant guys who are being very derisive about her. And, you know, they're kind of making fun of her. And also she's contrasted with the nuclear physicist that Kimberly and Richard meet, who is very academic about his activism and, and is very lucid and very forensic about why it's a problem. Another thing that this film was doing, which I had no idea about until it mentioned it in one of the documentaries I was watching, the producers made an effort to cast different ethnicities in roles behind the camera. So, you know, you've got the character of Hector, yeah. who is Hispanic. Yeah. And you've got Kalia Ali, who is the daughter of Muhammad Ali. She's one of the crew. So you've got all these black or kind of darker faces behind the camera and all these white faces in front of it. So that was that's another political issue that's sort of been kind of woven into the fabric of the movie that I wouldn't have otherwise really noticed. Yeah, no, I didn't pick that up either. I mean, obviously, it was a very white newscast. You pick that up as well. If you had to say, what does what happens to Kimberly in this story? Well, she stumbles upon a hard news story, but really what's happening to her is that she's experiencing sexism, career stumbling blocks in the form of boys club type men who are kind of keeping her in her place and putting her down and constantly reminding her that it's all just cosmetic. It's all about her aesthetic and everything like that. Do you feel like that part of the story is too on the nose? I think for the time it was probably relevant and I don't know how often, you know, I think for now it sort of feels, yeah, like we've told that story a lot, but I think for the time it was probably right. What's interesting about it for me is that, you know, her physical appearance is her foot in the door you know so she needed that to even get to where she was and then even in the party scene she almost seems to attempt to use it a bit to get her way with him when they're sitting on the couch and then kind of I think quickly sort of abandons that yeah I think it it kind of accurately you know portrays that sort of dynamic of you know this has actually helped me get a job I really like like you know it says I'm in a job I really like and you know I'm going to do these puff pieces and whatever and you know when she's having that argument with Richard like she acknowledges that you know this is just kind of how it is basically and it's not going to change but then obviously her actions differ but you know I don't think it's too on the nose She's definitely flirtatious in that part yeah, of Yeah, I think so. And like you said before, she's a bit flirtatious with Jack Goddell. I think this is a woman who has learned that, you know, there aren't many doors. This is one door. It's something she can use and it is a way in. But equally, I feel like she feels uncomfortable with it. Like she's not, I mean, Jane Fonda in other films can use that no end. But in this film, I feel like she's a little bit awkward with how she is trying to use her femininity to kind of get what she wants. And I guess in this case, when she's having that conversation with, I can't think of his name, her boss mm. of the studio, it just doesn't work. Like, you know, he's like, you know, oh, well, we'll see what we can do for you or whatever when she's asking to do real news. And so it's just, well, in a way, it kind of gives her the out to kind of go rogue rather than you know, keep towing the line, basically. And he, I think he ends that conversation by going, keep your hair that way, I like yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> stupid like that. What did you think about Marilyn being on the wall? Because I know you're a big Marilyn fan. I enjoyed it. I'm guessing it's a Some Like a Hot reference. Yeah, that's what I had read. What do you mean a Some Like a Hot reference? Jack Lemon. Oh, right. Okay. Well, Jane Fonda had selected it. She oh. said that a lot of women identify with the tensions that Marilyn represented between strength and fragility, ambition and vulnerability, and that Kimberly Wells was struggling with those same tensions Mm. and we have to discuss the turtle yeah what's with the turtle so okay you know earlier in the film she'd said i'm going to the zoo she didn't bring a turtle from the zoo i thought she She stole a turtle from the zoo (laughs) no i thought maybe they loaned her a turtle for some sort of story or news piece she was gonna do she puts the turtle on the bed okay so it turns out i was wrong okay (laughs) maybe she has a pet turtle This, again, was Jane Fonda's idea. She did have a pet turtle and that, you know, her habit was to come home after a long day, bring the turtle in, grab some lettuce and then feed the turtle the lettuce but end up eating most of the lettuce herself. And so it was just, I guess, this idea of specificity to kind of give this character, you know, make this character nuanced. It was definitely odd. I like it. It's not a cat, which you would expect in most films. You'd pick up a cat. I don't think it's too weird to have a pet turtle. Huh. You think it's weird? Well, it's just unexpected. It's definitely a big one. Why wouldn't you put your pet turtle on the bed? Oh, it just seems hard for the turtle. Playback, please. Five, four, three, two, one. 
Go. Come on, camera two. We need to clear bars. Come on, this is only 40 seconds long. Let's hustle up. There we go. Camera two is clear. Okay, let's preview. Red hair was a good idea. We talked about cutting it. What did she say? We haven't talked to her about it, but she'll do what we tell her. Good. Okay, we're now going to take a break and play our interview with Neil Sinyard. He is an emeritus professor of film studies at the University of Hull and visiting professor of film at the University of Lincoln. His essay, Accidents Will Happen, The China Syndrome, was published as part of the Indicator Blu-ray release of the movie. I guess to just start by asking how you came to, to study film. Oh, well, film has been a lifelong passion of mine, but my original education was very traditional English literature. But gradually I moved over to getting film studies incorporated into the English degree that I was teaching and it became so popular that I sort of proposed to my head of department should we set up a separate film studies department and they said yes and uh, I sort of took it from there. Were you approached by Indicator to write the essay or was that something that you'd already previously written? No I was approached by Indicator to to write it. I've done a few things for them. It was a film I admire a lot and so I uh, I said would you mind if I wrote something up? something on it, and um, they, they agreed. It's a wonderful essay. I loved it. Oh, thank you very much. That's kind of you. Can you tell me when you first saw China Syndrome and what your impressions were? Yes. Well, I, I saw it when it first came out. You know, I, I'm that old. Um, <laughs> and I, again, I was very impressed then. It seemed to me a kind of culmination of 70s American cinema in some ways. You know, it was a kind of combination of disaster movie and conspiracy thriller. And that it seemed to summarize a lot of the anxieties that had been running through American cinema and American society, for that matter, during the 1970s. I've always been a huge fan of Jack Lemmon as well. He's always been one of my favourite screen actors. And I was intrigued by the casting of him. I thought that that particular aspect of the film worked marvellously. You write very eloquently about his casting and about what an unusual choice that is. It sort of doesn't quite gel or mesh with the Jack Lemmon that we or the screen persona no. of Jack Lemmon that we know. That's right, and I think that in some ways that gives the film a more subversive edge. When Jane Fonda is cast in a film like that, you know, she brings with her certain aspects of her screen persona that is very progressive, and we sort of expect, therefore, and anticipate how she's going to behave in those situations. But with Jack Lemmon, you know, I, I was trying to think, uh, you know, have I ever before seeing Jack Lemmon in a car chase. You know, I, I certainly couldn't remember any other film in which he ended up dead. I love the bit in the film, actually, when he snatches the gun from the security man, if you remember, to take control of the control room. And he looks as if he's never handled a gun before in his life, which, uh, which makes it all the more alarming. You know, I mean, he may shoot somebody by accident. Because Lemmon, in so many of his films before then, you know, represented the average American, almost the American nightmare, Nice guy. I think the force of the film comes a lot from his casting as a man who is a reluctant rebel. You know, he as a, says in the film, you know, I, I love this plant, it's my whole life. You know, he doesn't want to believe what he's discovering with, with his own eyes, but he's forced into a situation where he has to react in the extreme way that he does. And I think this is part of the, the power of the film. With that casting and with that characterization, it really sort of brings home the urgency and the intensity of the situation. I agree. I don't think it would have any, been anywhere near as effective had Jack Lemmon been sort of immediately suspicious, you know, if, if he wasn't going to lose something um, by, you know, coming out with what he knew. Yeah, exactly. I think I quoted in the essay, you know, the Pauline Cohen say, I couldn't understand why he was so nervous he broke down in this interview. And I thought that was really perverse. I thought, for goodness sake, the man's had his life threatened. His career is on the line. He's uh, holding his the company that he loves to ransom. I mean, you know, what else would you need for a character to be in a state of, you know, sort of imminent nervous breakdown in that situation? No, I think that he's very well characterised. But I think all of them are, actually. I think all of the leading performances and the supporting performances are extremely well cast and extremely well done. Pauline Kale was always a little perverse anyway. It's, I think it's part of what made her <laughs> writing so good. <laughs> That's true. I love the argument in your essay that, you know, you say sort of distilled to, a, to its essence, the film is essentially about people 
who are finding it increasingly difficult to be heard. Yes. And yeah. that starts out literally, but it kind of becomes much bigger than that. It becomes sort of metaphorical. They just, nobody... That's can... right. You, you were saying, how did it affect me when I, when I first saw it? I thought, you know, yeah, this is a really good thriller. But I, I think it still held up really well. I think it, it's still about institutions and power and commercialism and the difficulty of the whistleblower you know of, of the individual actually trying to subvert that when he discovers that something is badly amiss I, I was intrigued as well by the fact you, you mentioned about people not able to be heard that was one of the things that struck me about the film when i saw it again the moments of silence in it are very powerful that building to the moment you know when we see the shot of michael douglas screaming as jack lemon is being, being shot and, and there's no sound coming out. You do get this thing of, of people literally struggling to be heard. Uh, practically the first thing Jane Fonda says in the film is, you know, is anybody listening to me? And then it broadens out, as he said, to this uh, much more metaphorical statement of the difficulty of the individual against the institution. You're right, the film holds up really well in part because I think it's so well made, but also in part because all of the issues in yeah. it are still so topical. I think one of the things that the film does really well, actually, is integrate the whole thing about TV news into the actual thing, which was apparently, well, not a late decision. Originally, I think it was just basically going to be about the accident. When Jane Fonda and James Bridges came into the project, they expanded it to include the Jane Fonda character as this TV newswoman. And you could see how easily that could have gone wrong in a way. It could have deflected from the main argument or sentimentalised it or romanticised it. But in fact, they, they integrated so well that it becomes really a part of the whole thing. And this thing about uh, gendered politics within the media is still uh, a very topical and a very powerful one. You point out that Kimberly is given no love interest and I hadn't it hadn't occurred to me until I read it, but I I thought, my goodness, that would have probably been a really obvious thing to do, and it's a credit to the film that it doesn't do that. I think there's just one message on our answer phone that uh, <laughs> suggests, you know, a casual relationship in, in the past. But I, I, again, I, I think that was that was really good, and of course, the way Jack Lemon is characterised as well, we see a very sort of brief glimpse of his home life, and they're very similar. You know, they're both sort of quite lonely people, I think, who are dedicated professionals. But again, I, I think it's a, a tribute to the tightness of the scripting, is that there's absolutely nothing extraneous in the film at all. There's no, no romantic subplot, no romantic interest, etc. Uh, all of the various strands of the script are really woven together very, very skillfully. As I mentioned, uh, I think the, in the essay, I think the ending is superbly handled. I think that, that is the crux of the film for me, I think, is almost what happens after when, the, when they come out and have to present what has gone on to the waiting journalists and to the television audience outside kind of thing. And I think the film's negotiation of all the different stories that are already beginning to ferment in that is, is very clever, very, very well done. That scene at the end with, you know, Jack obviously being executed is... You know, up until yeah. that moment, it's just so nail-biting. It's You feel like you can't breathe while you're watching it, and it just gets worse and worse. Well, I, I was watching it with my, my mum and uh, daughter, and they gasped when that happened. Mm. Uh, there was something that they really hadn't expected. And I thought, nothing, my daughter had seen the film before, and, uh, and, and it's so well filmed, that moment, you know, when he's running towards the camera and suddenly the shots ring out and you can hardly believe what he's seeing. It's terrific. James Breaches had a funny career in films, I think. I think he only directed about eight films. He turned down some interesting films. I think he was going to down to do Summer of 42 at one stage and Carrie, uh, The Verdict, I think, was two other films he was mentioned in connection with. But I think this is a film for which you'll probably be remembered. He does a really fine job, I think. It is, and it's not overly stylized. It's quite clean and quite oh. traditional. And yet, it, it is very carefully planned, I think. I think. The parallels he draws between the TV studio and the actual power plant are very interesting. I think one of the things I like about the film, actually, is it's got a, it builds up a sense of paranoia in daylight. Everything seems to be happening visibly, and yet you, you feel all the important decisions are 
being taken almost as, as if they're hidden in plain sight. You can't hear the, the really important decisions that are being made. Kind of uh, subverts expectations in that way, but I guess also in the way of, you know, not having that ambient, scary score, not having the, you know, the thriller tracking shots. It's a it's a yeah. nail-biting thriller, but it, it does so in such a lucid way and without using any of those manipulations. I was just thinking about how it tied in with other 70s American films. When I was um, preparing to write the essay, one exchange from The Godfather kept coming into my mind, which was, remember the bit in The Godfather where Al Pacino's Corleone's uh, reuniting with, with Kay, the Diane Keaton figure, and, and he says to him something like, you know, my father's no different from any other businessman. And Kay says to him, oh, Michael, you're so naive. Other businessmen don't get people killed. And he says, who's being naive? I thought, you know, <laughs> that kind of business ruthlessness. Then I was reminded of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, of, again, the individual against the institution. And Milos Forman saying when he was directing it, you know, authority in trouble, he says, will sacrifice anything and everyone to prove its point. And then I thought of Network, uh, you know, the Sydney Lumet film about TV and its handling of TV news. One of the things that's really nice about the China Syndrome is that it, I think it collects together a lot of things about as I say, American society, but also about 70s American cinema and brings it to, to a head and in some ways I think brings it to a conclusion. I think it's going to be the last film for a while uh, in American cinema that, that, that does this. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're right. There is a lot of disillusionment about sort of, sort of the system and, and that cynicism. You point out an interesting conflict with Kimberly, Jane mm. Fonda's character, because she, you know, doesn't want her value to be based on her attractiveness, and yet we see her tell Richard to watch for the tiredness circles under her eyes, and we see her flirting yeah, yeah. with Jack and the network bosses to try and achieve her own ends. I'm wondering, do you see yeah. that, that as particularly hypocritical, or do you think we could make an excuse for it? One of the things that's really interesting to me about this, in, in terms of the disaster movie kind of thing in which you said, the characters do evolve and develop. Kimberly is a career woman. She's not like the Michael Douglas character who, you know, is the freelancer. She's not uh, averse to using a bit of flirtatiousness to move up the, the career ladder. But I, I think as the film develops, you do get a, the sense of, of a character who does evolve, um, who gets really involved, particularly with this particular story that she's working on. I mean, I, I think it's interesting to speculate what will happen after this. Is she going to get her wish to have a more serious news coverage. Again, I think I pointed out the comment by the uh, controller, you know, about you know, she did a really good job. Not that I'm surprised. I've always found that remark highly ambiguous and quite disquieting. What does it mean? Is he, is he taking credit for it? Um, should he be thinking about the job that she's doing at that time, rather than the issue that she's actually reporting on? Again, I, I think that's one of the things that's really good about, about the ending, is that it forces you to consider not simply what has happened but how what has happened is being reported and how that affects your interpretation of what has happened cutting from that to the commercial for microwave ovens is a master stroke you know of all things microwaves of all things the housewife in the kitchen the word commercial is practically the last word you hear i also like in the essay how uh, you say that the word accident is used about 25 times and that it it takes on yeah. more and more sinister implications yeah uh, I, I was actually counting it actually when i was uh, watching for a, for a second time because i was really struck by that i mean they really want to hammer it that accident begins to gather a multitude of meanings and more and more sinister meanings. The film had very much the Karen Silkwood episode in, in mind when it was being made of, again, a, somebody who was going to report on company health and safety malpractice and met what was officially called an accident, but which subsequent investigations has thrown considerable doubt on that. It's a very sinister word in the film. So is the word job, I think. You know, obviously in this in this movie they're, they're doing their jobs, but their jobs are forever coming into conflict with their own sort of personal ethics and they're being asked to do terrible things yeah. and they're being bullied and things that happen at work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is what I meant by it. I think it's still a film that resonates 
because it says so much about how institutions operate and who takes responsibility, who is going to be, you know, to investigate this particular accident, who are going to be the scapegoats. It certainly won't be the people at the top. You can be sure of that. I, I, I mean, I like the little bit with, you know, the Wilfred Brimley character when they're reporting to the commission on the accident when it happens. He's kept in the interview, he says, for for hours. If they find anybody guilty of some kind of flaw, then you can be sure it won't be the people at the top. It will be the people, the underlings, if you like, who have to carry the can. Yeah, and there's that great line where Jack Lemon says to him, well, how do you even know there will be a scapegoat? And he just says tradition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. You described the ending of China Syndrome as ambiguous and you've explained a little why. I suppose it's unsettling that Kimberly's boss is just sort of commending her on the good job she's done and not really looking at the yeah. news story and what it means. It's almost like a little bit of apathy, which might be the wider problem, the fact that he doesn't even see it. Because, you know, this only, this only mattered yeah. while it mattered. And then once nuclear power's out of the news, it doesn't matter anymore, but the power stations still run. Yeah, that's, a good, that's what reminded me of network in a, in a way, you know, is the ratings that they're thinking of. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, she's done a good job. She's uh, scooped the other networks, you know. It's almost as if he's thinking of how it's going to look in terms of his job and, and, and his company, forgetting, you know, that there's a dead man at the end of this story, basically murdered in, in very suspicious circumstances. D- does um, seeing Jane Fonda in the China Syndrome sort of make you nostalgic for that Jane Fonda? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question. I don't know. I don't know whether I was ever nostalgic for Jane Fonda. I suppose the seventies was her great era in the movies. She was an absolutely marvelously accomplished actress then. I mean, she still is, I think. But you know, we were talking about Jack Lemmon and his, his casting. I, I can't think anybody other than Jane Fonda could have done that role with quite the conviction that she did. You know, she was marvelous in some of her earlier films, Clued particularly. I, I loved her performance in that. That kind of crusading Jane Fonda, I, I do have a nostalgia for, actually. You, you, I haven't really thought about it. I think she's become a bit more philosophic and patient in her advancing years. I suppose we all do. But there was a real progressive edge, I think, to her persona in that time. I can't think quite of her equivalent today. Now, there's certainly need for it, I think. Yeah, I think she was... I mean, her whole life's been pretty exceptional. I don't know that if there is really an equivalent. No. We got those influx of films, you know, around this time where she was sort of, her films became heavily politicised. We got Clute coming home, nine to five. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, now she's in Grace and Frankie and I just, I miss that the Jane Fonda that was doing this kind of work. You cite a particular review that mentioned that because she cries at the end of the film, this proves that she can't yeah. handle hard news and that, you know, kind of undoes some of the kind of women's lib agenda that the film had been pushing. And yeah. you sort of fight against that. Saying, you know, that she's not fit to handle hard news simply because she's crying. As I point out, actually, when she, she's crying, she's not actually on camera, at that, I don't think, at that particular point. Given the fact that, you know, she'd seen a man shot dead at her feet, I think there's uh, every reason why she should do it. One of the nice things, I think, though, about another thing, the nice thing about the ending, I think there is a sense in which her first interview with Jack Lemmon doesn't go very well. I think they say to her, you know, he came across as a lunatic or something like that. And her inexperience, perhaps, is is showing there. She can't get him to keep to to the point. The intervention of the Rimley character gives her a second chance. I, I think that's, that's very well handled in the film because she, she knows she might have messed up the first interview, but she seizes this second chance to get something out of, of, of this character and shows that she has, you know, the, the tenacity of an authentic news reporter. I don't see any dilution of the women's lip at the end there. I think her reaction are emotionally very credible and as I say she does redeem herself I think in uh, having a second crack at the Wilfred Brimley character over the objections of the other people you know the, the company men who are trying to usher him away and really get at her impressions of the Jack Goodell character which contradict those of you know the company man seizes on the initiative to, to counter that as I say the, the ending maintains this unease, 
I think, that you're left with in the film. It's very clever, actually, the way that it, you don't end depressed. You've been very excited by it, by the film. It gives you a sense that some sort of justice should be done, but it it's not glib. It's not sentimentalised. Um, it does leave a lot of things sort of tantalisingly in the air for you to think about at the end. This has been really wonderful, and I've taken up half an hour of your time. Uh, thank you so much for coming onto the show. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's been very nice to talk to you, Luke. Please. Kimberly, can you hear me? And yeah, Mac? Change of schedule. Oh, you got to be kidding. Again? Nope, we're going to Ventana. That's great! Yeah, you got to be there at 1.30. Wait, what about the crew? What about Richard and Hector? No, they'll pick you up and you can all drive up together. Right, okay. Here, try to get Thanks. I don't smoke. Did you watch any of the deleted scenes in this film? No, I haven't Haven't found the time. Okay, so there is one that I had to show Cass because it is so outrageous. So this is a scene that was deleted from the party sequence where, you know, Kimberly's gone to that kind of news party. It's with the lead anchor, you know, who she kind of quibbles with through the yeah. film. So they're standing by the pool and he asks her if she wants to play cars. And she's like, what do you mean? And then he grabs her tits and goes honk, honk. And then does she push him in the pool? And so she pushes him in the pool and walks away. I mean, that shocking. scene is like the climax scene, so to speak, of the objectification of Kimberly, isn't it? Yes. So that would be like the one where it's the most glaring. And it's also the one where she finally reacts to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like it's her last draw. Like, I feel like by the time she has that go on the couch, and I think from there, things kind of shift a bit. She gives her boss a look as she's walking away, like, I am not going to put up with this anymore. But I'm glad they, they didn't put it in because it is so crass and, I don't know, left left feel. You would remember that scene above <laughs> others. If it was in there, you'd just be like, uh, no, nah, it wouldn't work. Do you want to play cars? Hong Kong. I'm kind of glad they took that out just hearing about it. It's fun to watch, though, as a deleted scene. In anything that man ever does, there's some element of risk, right? Well, that's why we have what we call defense in depth. Now, that means backup systems, two backup systems, two backup systems. You were there, and you saw what happened. There was no leakage of radiation. You know why the system works? Even with a faulty relay, even with a stuck valve, that system works. So apparently director James Bridges had an agreement with Jack Lemmon that he would not get to Jack Lemmon. Huh. And so after some takes, Bridges would cut and say to him, Jack, it's too lemony. Aww. Uh, yeah, he wasn't lemony in it. No, we don't get a lot of the Jack Lemon mannerisms. You know, he usually has the stuttering, double-step car salesman quality to yeah. him, and he doesn't really have that in this film. It's sort of uh, absent of the kind of ticks and things that he would fall back on, I think. Yeah. He had to be a little braver here, and I think that's why he, it is such a great performance. He did do a great performance. The sound in this film is really interesting. Cass, you were saying to me that there is absolutely no non-diegetic sound in this film. Other than the opening credits, it's all what the characters hear is what the audience hears. So we've got that one song, which I think is somewhere in between, which I like that song, which... Given how suspenseful and stressful it is to watch this film, it's amazing. To create that without the music. Yeah, and they do it all with alarms and, you know, sounds of the the machine and the plant. But it does include some music, obviously, but it is diegetic music. It's interesting as well because so much of this film is about what is heard and what is not heard. Richard, when he wants to air the accident they filmed, he is silenced. Kimberly, when she wants to do, wants to talk to her boss about doing serious news stories, she is silenced. Godel, when he begins to suspect the plant isn't safe, he is being silenced. The protesters who stand before the commission literally have tape over their mouths. Um, There's that amazing shot of Michael Douglas screaming soundlessly from the glass gallery when Jack is shot. You know, that's such a memorable image. It's sort of a frightening image, especially because I think he's got that long hair. There's a violence in that moment. Apparently a score was composed by Michael Small. He'd done nine films for Alan J. Pecola, so he seems the perfect fit for this film. He also did that brilliantly eerie score for Clute. Do you remember that? Michael Douglas said that once they added the score to the film, what was dramatic became melodramatic and that it was ultimately surplus to requirements. James Bridges just kept cutting bits of the score out here and there until it just became obvious that he just needed to cut the whole thing out. And I think it's a good call. I think it gives the film an added sophistication that it 
doesn't rely on that. Yeah, you certainly don't notice it, and it would be kind of weird for someone to be driving away from somewhere and just some music starts playing Yeah, outside of the soundscape of the film. You would almost think it was shot knowing that, though, because of like it was all so tight and, mm. you know, in their eyes or their reactions, you'd almost think they knew that they weren't going to have the sound because they needed the facial expressions of the actors to be so central. I think it's it's perfectly judged, and I love that the film ends in dead silence, which is mm. what we imagine will happen if the China Syndrome were ever to take place. There would just be this universal silence. Mm. I just have one thing left to ask you guys. Have you heard of the Jane Fonda effect, or did you read about it? No, the Jane Fonda effect, no. You've told me about it, but... Oh, okay, that phrase was coined in an article written by Stephen J. Dubner and Stephen D. Levitt in the New York Times Magazine in September 2007. And the basic argument of the article is that Jane Fonda may have inadvertently contributed to global warming. So their argument is that the panic surrounding the release of the China Syndrome put a stop to the growth of nuclear power plants which produce no carbon dioxide emissions. Therefore, we're continuing to burn coal and other fossil fuels which do contribute to global warming. Three Mile Island in 79, Chernobyl in 86 and Fukushima in 2011 have created a widespread stigma about nuclear power, which is not unjustified but really humankind has no sustainable energy alternative that would be su- sufficient to power society at its current population. Population. At the moment, it's fossil fuels and nuclear energy, and neither are sustainable long term. Currently, 80% of the world's power comes from fossil fuels. Many smaller countries now run almost entirely on renewable energy, which is renewable energy is the future. It's what we're going to have to move towards if we're going to continue to have life on this planet. Oh, just checking. Have we done the end of the film? Yeah, we haven't really done the climax. Oh, okay. Let's talk about the ending. Did you think we had? I said about... all I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> which means all that matters has been said. (laughs) Um, I don't even need to say much. But... Well, we talked about Kimberly's broadcast, so for me that was the ending, but I guess we're talking about the ending before the ending? It's kind of a big climax of everything, triple climax, this movie. So there's a really kind of big setup. The vehicle through which the climax is told is a live interview on Kimberly's station, uh, which she will host. It's her hard news story. How we come to get to this interview is that Goodell, forever the practical considered man, uses a gun to take over the control room of the plant. Richard Adams remains in the viewing room, thereby over hearing the plans of plant owners and operators to block the television signal so we know time is of the essence the operators contact the SWAT team to break into the control room there's a really big setup here lots of establishment that's done very naturally as you say Luke without exposition because we're aware of both the dangers to the public and the consequences to the lead characters if the story is not told we don't need to rehash anything which helps with the pacing and the tension arises from this culmination of events and is shown with some particularly amazing editing we cut from inside the control room to inside the viewing room to the network headquarters to the power plant employees attempting to shut down the transmission to outside the plant where the SWAT team and news crews arrive and then we get to the live interview I don't know about you guys but I feel uh, just this abject horror that Jack Goodell can't get his words out like he's given this opportunity and he can't get his words out and if you were a viewer of the broadcast rather than the movie you wouldn't know what he was referring to you'd believe this lie that he's a madman who had taken forceful control of a nuclear power plant and was putting the safety of all of California at risk. So we therefore need some backup to break the story, which is where two more things come into play. One of those is the killing of Jack Goodell and the interview of Ted Spindler by Kimberly Wells. Just before dying, Goodell states, I can feel it. And this is followed by a second accident at the plant, which can now not be hidden from the public, despite that live transmission ending moments before. So in this moment, Jack Goodell is vindicated. And while this still could have been somewhat covered up by the plant owners and operators, Ted Spindler, as I said before, he redeems himself by answering truthfully the questions posed to him by Wells, who thereby breaks the story wide open and achieves her ascension from fluff pieces to hard news. I thought it was very powerful. I really liked how the last thing he says is, I can feel it, because he's so haunted by the shudder ever since the accident. So it sort of felt very fitting, plus redeeming him. And also that in death, he warns of this accident that's about to happen. He's the only one that can feel it because he's the one that's lying on the floor. Yeah, It's the first false ending because we think once Jack is shot, okay, now the movie's going to wrap up. And we don't know that another 
accident is about to happen, the first time we know is with those whispered words before death, which is I can feel it. When the lights go out, I think that is such a scary moment of the film and just those close-ups of everybody's faces as they're waiting. And it is, it's really, really frightening. And it could have gone the way of, a, you know, a typical disaster movie and had a big meltdown at this point. I love how at the very end of the movie, after she finishes, she kind of puts the mic away and then you see the news carrying on with a new story, but there's just one camera still fixed on her and Richard has run out of the van and gives her a hug. And I love the idea that, oh, now life and society and everything. moving on. Did you notice on. what it was showing on the other screen? No. It was women using microwaves. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant, isn't it? Isn't that a brilliant... That's so good. Radioactive and anti-feminist. <laughs> All in one. It's probably one of the best structured examples of a Hollywood thriller that you could find. Damien, why don't you walk us through the release and reception of China Syndrome? So the China Syndrome was released on March 16th of 1979, and as Luke stated in his introduction, it immediately became a massive hit. Before we look at the box office of the film, uh, let's just look at the cinematic climate that the film was released into. Superman was released about three months prior in December of 1978 and had been at number one in the box office charts for 11 of its 13 weeks of release. For two weeks in February, The Warriors had knocked it down to number two before it returned to the top. Some of the films that didn't knock it down were Jane Fonda's California Suite, Every Which Way But Loose starring Clint Eastwood, the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Michael Chimino's The Deer Hunter and Sally Field in Norma Ray. So it had been very, very successful against a lot of major competition. The China Syndrome caught the interest of the public, however, and was the second film to displace Warner's superhero blockbuster. It finished its first four weeks atop the box office before The Deer Hunter, on the back of a Best Picture win at the 51st Academy Awards on April 9th, displaced it at the top in its 13th week of release. The China Syndrome stayed in the top 10 at the box office for 10 of its first 11 weeks, eventually falling out due to the glut of notable new releases such as Manhattan, Alien, Phantasm, Rocky II and Luke, the main event. Overall, it grossed $51.7 million, placing it among the highest grossing 20 films of the year, but well behind leaders such as Kramer vs. Kramer, The Amityville Horror and Apocalypse Now. Box office takings for the film actually did go up following the Three Mile Island nuclear accident. Uh, which occurred less than two weeks after the film's release. Not wanting to be seen as capitalising on the accident, both Michael Douglas and Jack Lemmon cancelled late-night talk show appearances and banners promoting the film were largely removed from circulation. I did read that the film was pulled from some theatres, although I couldn't verify this. In fact, Michael Douglas' only comment at the time on Three Mile Island's relation to the film was that there were ironic similarities between the incident at Three Mile Island and the movie's fictional power plant. Fonda and Lemmon had been long-time anti-nuclear activists, and while Lemmon remained silent, Fonda did what Fonda does and did not. Following the accident, she called on President Carter to dismiss the sitting energy secretary and urged that nuclear power be a key issue for the following year's presidential campaign. Six months after the film's release, she addressed a live audience of some 200,000 anti-nuclear protesters regarding the benefits of renewable energy. And obviously, almost 40 years after the film's release, these are still very hot political topics. Approval ratings for nuclear power in the United States in the wake of Three Mile Island and the release of the China Syndrome dropped from about 60 to 45 percent, although they did start to go back up again once the accident was out of the public eye. Anti-nuclear activists used the film as a catalyst for organising protests, including one that marched on Washington's Capitol building. Critical response to the film was excellent. Based on 30 reviews aggregated but on Rotten Tomatoes, the film holds an 83% score as a mark of 81, indicating universal acclaim on the more discerning Metacritic. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times called the film a terrific thriller, received in some quarters as a political film, but the movie is, above all, entertainment, well-acted, well-crafted and scary as hell. Vincent Camby of the New York Times called it a smashingly effective, very stylish suspense melodrama. There is suspense almost from the film's start in a television newsroom and it builds without much let-up and until the finale. Judith Martin of the Washington Post said it was a terrific film, the triumphant culmination of many elements that have been attempted in previous ambitious films. This has a wealth of true movie ingredients, two or three meaty subjects handled with naturalistic ambiguity, suspense, a variety of interestingly developed characters finally acted, excitement and authenticity laced with restrained satire. The film played in competition at the Cannes Film Festival in May of 1979, but lost out in the race for the Palme d'Or to a tie between Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now and Volker Schlondorf's The Tin Drum. It didn't go home empty-handed, however, with Jack Lemmon winning Best 
Best Actor for his role in the movie. He followed this up with a nomination at the 52nd Oscars for Best Actor, but lost to Dustin Hoffman in Kramer vs. Kramer. Jane Fonda got a nomination for Best Actress, but lost to Sally Field in Norma Ray. Other nominations included Original Screenplay and Art Direction. It did get a nomination for Best Picture Drama at the Golden Globes and for Best Director, in addition to Actor, Actress and Screenplay. Unfortunately, it went home without reward, uh, but as I said before, it was a very strong year. Shriner Syndrome is actually listed on the list of films not yet named to the registry list uh, by the National Film Registry, but it can be voted on for preservation. Can we vote for the National Film Registry? I don't know, but it seems to indicate on the website that anyone can vote. Huh. Uh, Let's do our quiz. I hope that you've both brushed up on your research. I'm going to start with you. Mm. So two actors were offered the role of Jack Godell, but turned it down. Name one of them. Marlon Brando. No. Damn. Damien? Jack Nicholson. Yes. Because apparently only Jacks can play Jack (laughs) Goodell. He'd apparently agreed to The Shining, so he couldn't do it. The other actor cast was Robert Redford. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so Damien, that's one for you. Oh, I get a point. Yeah, and now it's your question. Name one of the alternate titles considered for the film. I can name two if you'd like. Go on. Uh, Power and Eyewitness. That's correct. Question three, Cass. Uh... General Electric withdrew its sponsorship from a certain TV host special interview with Jane Fonda about the China Syndrome upon its release. Do you know who the TV journalist was? It's a female and she's pretty much the person that interviewed celebrities at the time. Uh, um, not Oprah Winfrey. Damien? Uh, Barbara Walters? That's correct. I was, I was picturing her, but I mind blank. Cass, I'm killing you. Yeah. <laughs> Why did Jack Lemmon, after seeing the film, threaten not to promote it? I don't know. Because a few scenes he felt were key were removed from the final cut. Okay. Cass, what was the name of the 1971 documentary about power plant safety narrated by Jack Lemmon? <laughs> Damien? The powers that be. Jesus Christ. He really did his own <laughs> yeah. uh, This is just a washout. <laughs> the accident depicted in the film is based on what real life incident? It was based on two, I believe. Um, there was one, forget where it was, there was one in Alabama in 1975 and there was one in 1970 somewhere else. In Chicago. That's the one I've got. I don't have the Alabama one. It was the Commonwealth Edison's Dresden 2 nuclear power plant and there was an accident on June 5th, 1970, which was similar to what happens in the film. Uh, Cass, rating out of five. I gave it four. Four stars? Okay. Damien? I gave it four and a half. I gave it four and a half as well. Love it. Yeah, it's a great movie. So that's all we have this month for Celluloid Junkies. Next month we are going to be looking at Stanley Kubrick's 1957 courtroom drama Paths of Glory. Until then, we hope you have a lovely life and we'll see you next month.